Welcome everybody today for the next segment of the class. Uh, actually, this is literally a continuation. It's not a sharp break between the last lecture and today. Fortunately, the lecture today has some repeat of the equations or at least a version of those equations. So, plus I know you're all just totally fresh from the exam, so you know what the last lecture was anyway. Just teasing you a little bit, sorry. Just say a few words about the calendar. So we are right here today, Thursday 10-1. Oh my goodness, it is October. And we're going to do uh, risk sharing applications today. And then also nine, although this says risk sharing applications, I want a feature that will combine it with a production even in a more direct way than we will today. So two lectures today, Thursday and Tuesday on risk sharing. So that's the calendar. The second thing would be the reading list. And we are here at lecture eight. So the two readings today are risk and insurance in Village India, my paper in Econometrica. And we will cover that in a fair amount of detail today, although not every word, obviously. And also the chapter two in medieval village economy. So that's the reading list. So today is lecture eight, and that is here. So risk sharing applications, we're gonna do two different economies using the same theory, although the questions to be asked, though related, are a little bit different. One is Village India using consumption and income data, which I refer to as an ex post version of the implications of the risk sharing model, and also as anticipated the medieval village economy where we're gonna talk about dividing up the land. And you've seen maps of, of this before, but we didn't have all of the tools we needed to really do a good job that we do now. Okay, so for India, here's the motivation from my paper. A large part of the population in developing countries live in high risk environments. That said, there are numerous ways to cope with it. Uh, one is to diversify the activities you're undertaking, trying to have a portfolio, as it were, or ex post, after incomes get realized, to engage in financial transactions, including gifts and transfers among family and family networks. How well do any one of these ex post or ex ante mechanisms work? Well, the main, quote, insight of the paper was that we really don't necessarily have to enumerate the mechanism, we just look at the outcome. I'll qualify that a little bit and we can keep coming back to this. If they diversified perfectly and everyone had a balanced portfolio, then they would all have the same outcome and there'd be no further risk to share. So in some sense, what we're gonna go through today would not have much content in the sense that Today, we're referring to risk sharing, but it's not done per se by sharing risk after the fact. It's done by ex ante diversification. Anyway, those two strands to repeat are going to be in today's lecture. We're going to do the ex post part first, which assumes partial but not complete diversification, and then look at how they could do it ex ante with partial but potentially not complete diversification. All right. So, characteristics of village economies, as in India, very risky place, in large part because agriculture does not provide a stable source of income. There's a lot of risk, idiosyncratic and aggregate risk. Households diversify in many ways, one, not planting all of the same crop. And we are going to use this benchmark, which assumes there's no information problem, no moral hazard problem, no contract enforcement problem. All of those words at this point in the class don't make a whole lot of sense because we haven't studied anything but these sort of frictionless economies. But that was the premise. And again, to anticipate subsequent lectures, today we'll see how well this theory does without any of these frictions. And then subsequent literature has started to assume things like contract enforcement and information asymmetries, but we are not going to do that today. So how do they diversify? 
Well, in a village, Arapali, which was under the auspices of a crop institute for crops under the semi-arid tropics, Icrasat, Arapali, farmers in Ar Arapali grow sorghum, they grow castor. Sorghum is a grain like wheat. Castor, you may have heard of as in castor oil. It's both used in diet, but also it turns out to be a lubricant for jet engines. Anyway, the coefficients of variation are 0.5 and, and about 1. Now, you may not remember that in medieval villages, we talked about a very risky environment with a coefficient of variation of yields of about 0.35 or something like that, which delivered, you know, a disaster every 12 years. So it's more risky than that, taking any one crop one at a time. But they can diversify over crops. So looking at the cross crop correlation, those numbers range from 0.09 to 0.81. Of 0.09, it's almost the case that the yields on one type of crop are independent of the yields on the other one. Again, you can go back and look at the lecture under consumer preferences where we were introducing risk and derived these kinds of statistics. Soil isn't uniform either. So even taking as given that they're gonna do castor, they can plant it in one type of soil or another. Each type is risky with a coefficient of variation from 0.7 to again, a little over one, but that you can diversify over soil as well with a correlation of only 0.37. So pretty good diversification possibilities. That said, households don't hold completely balanced portfolios across soils and crops. One household will plant more of one crop than the other, or for castor, have more of one type of soil than the other, despite all the diversification possibilities. And going outwards from crops to other act income generating activities, they can engage in wage labor, they can do trade in handicrafts, or animal husbandry. So for example, trade in handicrafts in Arapali consists of climbing palm trees to get the fruit from which they will make palm liquor, for example. And it's a pretty specialized activity. It looks like uh, telephone repairmen climbing poles with pretty, pretty heavy and fancy equipment. Animal husbandry consists of grazing animals and so on. Anyway, if you look at how much land they hold, it varies from no land at all to being a small holder or medium or large holder. And so, for example, not surprisingly, the more land they have, the more is their income from crops, going from about 2% to 56% of the total income. Likewise, when they hold very little land, most of the income is from labor, wage labor, and that drops to 4% for the rich guys, large landholders in the village, and so on. Those patterns are pretty much repeated in the, the other two villages, in Kanzara especially. Shirapur is much flatter in the sense that we don't see very sharp gradients in terms of income, percentage of income from various sources as we move from small. So villages are kind of a metaphor. Villages are not all alike. But the techniques we're going to use today do take into account the differences. Now let's look at diversification over income sources the way we did for crops and soil types. This is a little bit difficult to read, and I'll tell you why. Going down the diagonal here, is the coefficient of variation of each income source. So for example, profits from crop production is quite risky with a coefficient of 4, 0.42, which we almost said a minute ago, uh, of livestock income, OV, the CV is 0.21, et cetera. Now these other off diagonal elements here represent the co-variation. So what would have been better would have been to list profits, livestock income, earned wages, and trade and handicrafts going down the rows, and then picking a row, move across the column to find the covariance. So for example, this guy here is the covariance between profits from crop production and livestock income, and it's actually negative. So huge diversification possibilities for a household if they were doing both crops and livestock. These uh, 
lower off diagonal elements are not filled in because the matrix is symmetric. The covariation of activity I with activity J is the same as the covariation of J with I. So it would be redundant to fill them all in and they were deleted to kind of make it easier to read. So taking into account different soils, different crops, different income sources, piling them all together and plotting income over the 10 years for which we have the data, we look what happens over time from 1976 to 1985, essentially. And what's getting plotted is not just the time series of one household, all of them are getting plotted here. In fact, the way the data were coded, low numbers correspond to little or no land and high numbers correspond to lots of land. So as we move backwards along the household number, the households are getting more and more land and, and are actually, you know, net worth is going up. You know, so that 1% of the population that owns 50% of the wealth, that's this guy back here. Now, I refer to this graph as the Rocky Mountains because you can see all the peak, well, not quite. I was going to say you can see all the peaks and valleys. That's wrong. When you have a peak, you can't see the valley behind it. If all these incomes co-moved with each other, then everyone's peak would happen at the same time and it would look like waves. Instead, we see this rather jagged, sharp picture. And again, when, when you're able to see the valley behind, it's because there's not a peak in front of it. Now, the other thing is moving along this gradient, I should have pointed this out earlier, there is a zero here. This zero corresponds to the overall average of income, both over households and over time. So these guys are below average income. These guys behind it are higher average income. And again, you can see that that's quite a salient gradient. Here is the corresponding picture for grain. And I could have plotted all consumption items, but it would have looked similar. The paper actually does that. When I say corresponding, I mean the scale hasn't changed. The scale that was used to plot income, 4,000 at the peak, is the same as the scale that's being used to plot consumption. So you can see everybody's consumption is compressed. So they're smoothing. They're smoothing over time. And to a degree, they're on a large degree, they're actually smoothing over households as well. Those very wealthy guys are consuming more than the poor guys, but not nearly as much as income is higher for them relative to income of low guys. The main point of the picture, however, is that here you can almost see the waves. Grain consumption is kind of co-moving. That would be easier to see if we kind of blew it up, but we will look at this statistically as well in a few subsequent slides. And I refer to this as Kansas. I don't know if you, any of you have ever been in Kansas. I ask this every time I teach this diagram. At one point, some student in the class said, I'm from Kansas. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I hope I haven't insulted you. He said, no, no, it is really boring there. Okay, well, I like Kansas. I'm not saying that, but anyway. Amber waves of grain. So consumption versus income. So let's think about a theory to try to explain the difference between those two diagrams. And this is the bit that's a little bit of a review, but I think a useful one. So we're gonna talk about individual K alive at day T that has experienced a history of shocks HT. Where this history is the shock at day one, the shock at day two, and the, the shock at day three. So again, this is the state space representation of the tree that you saw in Debru, and I featured at least twice already. What is the objective function? We're going to solve that programming problem to go back and forth between solutions to that problem and Pareto optimal allocation. So we're going to maximize a lambda weighted sum of discounted expected utilities, weighted lambda k for weight k over all the individuals and their capital M of them. The contemporary utility functions 
have as arguments the consumption of individual K at day THT, which we just did, and then this sort of age gender index. So not everyone is the same age, not everyone is the same gender. 18 year old males eat, you know, twice as much as anybody else, essentially. So we want to adjust the utility for these metabolic requirements. And they may not be treating the, the women very equitably either. But we are going to take these as metabolic weights that were measured in a dietary survey. Okay, so the other objects here are the probability of that history actually happening. Note that for any day T, we sum over all possible histories that could have given generated that node at day T. And then in addition, there are multiple dates, so we sum over those dates and discount them by beta. And again, the lambdas are the Pareto weights that vary between zero and one, and they sum to one, and we take the weighted sum. There are many, many resource constraints. There is a particular constraint for everyday T and all possible histories that could have led to T that simply says that the way you hand out consumption must not sum to something greater than the total that's available. So usually we talk about income. Now we just kind of went to total expenditure. But obviously, whatever income is, if it were spent, it would lead to expenditure, and then you could reallocate it. And some people might be consuming more than others. But here we take the total aggregate consumption as fixed. We're not going to put labor in here. It's just consumption. And we get first order conditions. So if you pick a particular consumption for a household K at day T as a function of a particular history HT, it would appear in the W contemporary utility function with the prime for the derivative weighted by lambda k and that beta to the t probability of ht would also be over there but we've multiplied through so that now becomes a term in the denominator and the numerator term here is mu so let me go back so the the mu is the lagrange multiplier on this resource constraint and it really should have a mu index by t and the history h of t because there is a constraint like this for every single possible history and date. So there are many, many constraints. That's why I caught myself when I said subject to one constraint. That's wrong. There's only one good, but there's many dates and many states. The mu that's appearing here didn't write an additional little t, which ought to be there probably, but anyway, mu tilde is the normalized version after dividing through by the discount rate and the probability. And if you started with particular utility functions like one of our favorite constant exponential utility, where sigma is the degree of risk aversion, it is of this form. Now there is a step that's happening here, which is imposing the way that these age and gender weights are entering into the utility function namely its consumption per unit index you know so pick a you know 30 year old male and then look at the other age groups and the other genders and the question is whether they're consuming more or consuming less than that baseline case so we you know for short can talk about this consumption per unit age that's really the object that's entering into individual case utility function and c tilde then replaces that normalized consumption c over a and when you do the math, you'll get the consumption formula, the risk sharing formula, as it were. So this is the per unit consumption of household individual K at day T. It has an intercept term, a term that depends on the demographics, and a term that depends on this Pareto, this shadow price mu. You've kind of seen this before, but let me remind you, this intercept term quite logically has to do with the Pareto weight. The higher is the Pareto weight of individual K, the higher is the log of the Pareto weight. It's normalized by this degree of risk aversion. If we move over here to the mu term, mu is the shadow price of consumption. It's how much the objective function would increase if you increase consumption by an infinitesimally small amount in the aggregate. So as mu goes up, consumption is going down. Why is that? Mu is the shadow price. So the lower is aggregate consumption, the higher will be the shadow price. 
So as mu goes up, there's less consumption to go around. So individual consumption is also dropping. And we will replace this by aggregate consumption and get a positive sign momentarily. The other interesting thing about this equation is, again, this one over sigma, which I feature in this term, although it's on all the other ones as well. And that is, if individual risk aversion goes up, this coefficient is going down. So as risk aversion goes up, this individual K should not experience too much variation in his or her consumption when the aggregate is moving because other people would be in a better position to absorb the aggregate shock if they were less risk averse than individual K. And again, you'll see that momentarily. Questions? My question is why there was a negative sign before the A, log A, the age and uh, sex index. It looks like in the utility function, when A goes up, the utility will goes up. When A is going up though, consum uh, consumption per unit age is going down. In, but in the utility function, the so they're becoming more urgent, so to speak, other things equal. So, um, you know, I'm sorry. I think I said it right the first time. Holding, con holding aggregate consumption fixed, for example, as their index is going up, mm. the consumption per unit index is going down. And that's the negative sign. It's really just that simple. Oh. All right. But thank you for asking the question. Um, all right, now, that was just one individual. We can put all the individuals together and allow explicitly for different risk aversion. And this formula appears in the paper and I'm not gonna try to derive it. It's somewhat tedious algebra, but the interpretation is easy. Namely, there's an intercept, something to do with demographics and something to do with aggregate consumption. In a little bit more detail, this is no longer individual K consumption. It's all the individuals in a household J. And unfortunately, that's all we see in the data. We don't see individual eating apart from that dietary survey. We just see aggregate household consumption. But that functional form allowed us to sum up over all the consumptions, and that's what we see. And we also have the age and sex uh, of all the members. So we also have the denominator. So this is household level consumption per unit age, and that should be higher. The higher is household J's lambda weight relative to the lambda weights of the other people in the village. It's a bit more complicated because these lambda weights are weighted by the degree of risk aversion. So it's a risk aversion weighted version of the lambda that we care about, comparing it to lambda J. Okay, this is the demographics. I may come back to that. This is the formula now in terms of aggregate consumption. This is the consumption of individual K and household J, I actually, but then summing over all households I. So this is aggregate consumption per unit age in the whole village. And again, you can see quite explicitly that J's consumption will move with that when sigma J is going down or the other way around. When household J is very risk averse, this coefficient is going to zero and individual consumption would not vary much with the aggregate. That's kind of the aggregate allocation of risk bearing. Because the theory has those age and gender weights in it, you can treat those as shocks, even though they're quite not moving in a surprise way, they are moving over time. They're moving intertemporally and maybe the whole village is getting older. Maybe one household is moving across metabolic categories faster than the other households are. And so the formula allows for that adjustment, comparing household J to the other ones. So let's look at an empirical implication, a linear equation, the consumption, the aggregate consumption, age weighted of household J has an intercept, depends on aggregate consumption, depends on the index of household J, and maybe on other things. This is just a version of this. Household J's consumption depends on an intercept, its age, 
and aggregate consumption. It's just much easier to write this way. And the theory has implications, namely, if everyone had the same risk aversion, then this beta J on aggregate consumption would be one. You can convince yourself this would be one because the sigmas are all alike, for example. Likewise, this demographic thing would have a coefficient of a one over sigma, the common sigma, and this other stuff, I saved the best for last. This is any other variable, including household income. And the theory is saying that this coefficient should be zero. Now that's very counterintuitive. How could I possibly be claiming that household consumption doesn't depend on household income? What about marginal propensity to consume and all of that? Well, the answer is they're pooling their incomes together as if in a mutual fund and then redistributing it as a function of the Pareto weights. So household J's income is kind of in there, but it's in the pooled version and it shows up in aggregate consumption. And if you control for that, then there's nothing left over. There's no idiosyncratic risk for household J to bear. Another way to say that is we're going to get perfect consumption insurance because like a large mutual fund, all the individual shocks go to zero. A version of this in China that I'm becoming aware of, Ali, Alibaba runs a mutual fund over health shocks. There's 100 million households joining and they pay ex post premia. Typical medical expense must be as high as $20,000. How much did they pay in? $9 in UN equivalent. So when you spread that damage of an individual household, which is high, over all the you know, hundreds of thousands of households, it almost goes to zero. And this is the extreme version of perfect pooling. That's contemporary China, not a village in India in 1985. So we can test the theory by looking at each household one at a time over the 10 years, and we can test the theory by pooling households together into one big uh, cross-sectional time-dependent regression. This is a little hard to see, but what's going on here statistically is testing these coefficients XE, which should be zero, to see whether they actually are in practice. Under the null hypothesis that it's zero, can you reject in a statistically significant way that is greater than zero or less than zero. And for most households, you can't, you know, the bulk of the households, you can't reject much one way or the other. There's just a handful of households on either side of the null. This test has power. This thing is, oh, well, maybe it's just noisy data and we can't infer much of anything. Maybe they're literally hand to mouth and they're eating entirely their income, in which case the coefficient would be one. And we can't reject that for all of them, for half of them. But for the other half, we can, you know, statistically reject that it's one. So there is a lot of smoothing going on. And this is for the other two villages down here. Uh, now let's talk about pooling it together. Actually, let's just jump here and then I'll go back. So here's the villages, Arapali, Shirapur, and Kanzara. And we're going to somehow take each household over time and take households in the cross section and come up with a coefficient on how much consumption is moving on average with household income. And the answer is roughly, should be in rupees, seven cents for the dollar. So if for every dollar change in income, consumption is moving by only seven cents. It's positive, it's statistically significant, we now reject the model. But as an approximation, we're doing quite well because these coefficients are small. So most, although not all, of the household-specific idiosyncratic risk is being pooled. And you can peruse this table and see, you know, this is crop profits as opposed to all income, labor income, profits from trade and handicraft, you know, you can look for the high numbers. So there are certain activities in certain villages that look relatively underinsured. This is like, who's the most vulnerable? You know, if we had the ability to come in externally and introduce a better insurance product, we would want to offer it to households that need it. Or if no one needed it, we would expect take up to be zero. So, you know, labor income is got a pretty high coefficient in Shirapur. 
and so on. But a lot of these are zero. Uh, that is to say, not statistically different from zero. So in that sense, it's a good approximation. Remember, according to Lucas, models are abstractions. They're meant to be stylized versions of reality. Because we have a model, we have an exact prediction of what we should expect to see. And through the lens of the model, we can decide how reality is doing relative to the model. So I'm not overly alarmed that we're gonna get statistical rejections. The question is, is it a useful starting point as an approximation? And the answer seems to be yes. I mean, I will share with you that when I wrote this paper, it kind of created a firestorm of alarm among policymakers who were astounded that poor households in villages in the caste system and so on could ever possibly be achieving anything close to an optimum. It just went against the grain of their prior presumptions, but it, it doesn't fit perfectly. So this slide, which I deliberately skipped over just now, is to say, look, you know, maybe I'm getting into a statistical stuff a bit and we can follow up later. One reason why this coefficient might be low is because this variable X is very poorly measured. Say it just got a lot of measurement error that is not real, then it's moving around a lot for spurious reasons and you would not expect that to influence consumption. So that biases this coefficient to something close to zero. Fortunately, we can correct for it with the panel and it's putting explicitly this measurement error into, in this case, idiosyncratic income, and then substituting that into those equations, we now see a correlation between the measurement error and the measured version of income, which means you can't run an OLS regression. But on the other hand, another way to do this is just to take first differences. Differences over time, over households, gives you another version. And it turns out this within coefficient and this across time coefficient allow you to essentially get rid of the measurement error. So this, you know, that that's this IV Grilich's Hausman thing, which I'm not going to go over. I still don't know what the re the best strategy is for me. If I skip stuff, then it looks like it came out of nowhere. You don't really understand it. Hence, I try in all these slides to show you the steps that are being taken. I'm deliberately not concealing something from you. But on the other hand, this particular sequence involves statistical material you may not have seen something similar to before. So if it's still quite opaque, don't worry too much about it. I'm just trying to be clearer. Okay, so that's summary. Risk and insurance in Village India. These villages are doing reasonably well, although not perfectly. They're sharing a lot of the risk. The reason that consumption looks so flat relative to income is because they're actively somehow or another engaged in borrowing and lending or transfers to bridge the gap between consumption and income. Now, another way they could handle the situation, so for this we're going to jump to medieval villages, is to potentially divide up the land. So this is the diversification part whether land holdings of a typical village would be consistent with the optimal allocation of risk predicted in that model just now on the premise that what you get is what you eat. You have these strips, the strips are subject to risk. You add it all up across all your land holdings and you eat it. So this is the other extreme, no ex post smoothing, no credit markets. Even going back you know, to lecture one or something where I presented all the different economies, we talked about the medieval village economy, we're about to do it now in terms of dividing up the land. We also talked about Thai village economy with that temple where households did not diversify. Some had low land, some had high land. They made donations to the temple and people that had a bad year got gifts back. So this, that thing, is the second thing is what's going on in the first, some mechanism for risk sharing ex post. This is the mechanism in the second, which is ex ante division of land. I think I said that in reverse order, but anyway. So you've seen this picture twice before. This is Elford Stratfordshire. Mr. Darlinston's land is uh, shaded in black and you know he's got something like 50 strips throughout the village. So why were they doing that? not just Mr. Darleston, but all of them to some degree. 
So if you think about this map, for example, are these types of land differ in some way from these types of land in terms of soil or slope or elevation? Or alternatively, land is all alike. And then the question is, you know, when the storm comes and destroys crops, you know, it could destroy these crops and not these. So there's really two different models, and we're only going to have time to do one, although the other one is covered in that missing medieval village chapter. We're going to do uniform shocks on non-uniform land, and the non-uniform shocks will save for another time. Okay, so there are two types of land. Start off keeping this simple say high low or clay sandy there's only two households another abstraction and there's only one date and land type k has a yield vector which varies with the shock epsilon and epsilon can take on capital s values so this epsilon is a measure of rainfall temperature humidity or other events which have beneficial or adverse consequences for the yield as captured by the way which the yield of type K land varies with those shocks. You've again seen this before a bit. When we did the dynamics, we planted land with seed and talked about how the yield could vary with low, medium, and high shocks. So this is very similar notation. Now, let's be serious, even though we're trying to keep this simple, what numbers do we use for this vector? Uh, one thing we want to capture is how much that yield is varying as measured by the coefficient of variation. And in medieval villages, it was about 0.35, which we've covered before. And I'm not going to go back and dig up those slides for you. But, but that was the number we used before. The other one is that there's two types of land here, k equal 1 or 2. And we want to choose vectors of returns for both. So we want to capture the covariance in the two types of land. How different are they from one another? And again, going back in earlier lecture, the estates of the Bishop of Winchester, we had a, a cross space correlation of 0.6. So we're going to take those numbers 0.6 and 0.347 as givens. But here's a simple you know, representation. Type lump, let's take again, only two types of land, one or two only three events, epsilon equal one, two, three. Type one land has the highest return in event one, then medium, then low. Type two land has uh, the highest return at the event two, surrounded by the lower numbers three and two. So if you aggregated up the total yield over all types, it would just be the sum of those columns and it would go 12, 10, seven. Now suppose we divided up the types of land in a very extreme way. We let household one have all of type one land and household two all of type two land. And the question for you is whether that would be an optimal allocation of land. If we did it that way and they were forced to eat the grain off their strips, would the consumption that we see correspond to the implications of the model? And the answer is going to be no, because the aggregate is going down as epsilon is going up. And that's true of household one's consumption, but it is not true of household two's consumption. This proposal fails the monotonicity requirement of the theory that as aggregate consumption goes down, everybody's consumption ought to go down, although some people's consumption could down more than others. So we reject this proposal for the allocation of land if the goal is to achieve an optimal allocation of risk bearing by land division alone. Well, you know, there are other ways to do it. Let's take the land type and give household J a proportional number of shares in the output of type of each type of land. So that means household J would get fraction alpha J of the output over each type of land. So we're, we're kind of redividing things here. We're going to have household one getting some proportion of this column, but also some proportion, not necessarily this, yes, in this case, the same of the other type of land. So this 
alpha J doesn't have a K on it, the shares depend only on the household, not on the type of land. The shares can depend on the household. All right, so it's linear in the aggregate. If we were over at school, you'd come up to my office and you'll see my bookshelf filled with stacks of books devoted to medieval English villages. I had a happy time doing a lot of research. And you just discover these amazing things. Holdings were scattered over fields so that each household partook in equal proportion of fertilizer and poor so soils. Dividing up the land in accordance with drainage and exposure, resources were divided into shares one man might have more shares than another, but the share them, shares themselves were equal. Now, there are potential problems. For the theory to fit exactly, we got to worry a little bit about the intercepts because those divisions did not allow the intercepts to be other than zero. If you go back to where we first introduced risk sharing and looked at particular utility functions, I showed you as example of the risk sharing rules two equations, constant relative risk aversion, constant absolute risk aversion, and the intercepts with zero under these various types of conditions. So it's not like they can't be zero, but it does require certain parameters to hold in order for that to be the case. So a little bit of a qualification. But we're, all is not lost. We can even do more. And namely, we don't have to have a given household having the same number of shares in every type of land. And that's going to allow various kinds of intercepts and so on. So here's the idea, idea, finally. Suppose there are at least as many land types with independent return vectors as there are states of nature. So what I showed you just now violated that. There were three states of nature and two types of land. But if we had three, three states of nature, we'd have to have three types of land with independent return streams. And likewise, S types of land, we need S uh, dimensional return vector. So one column cannot be derived as a linear combination of the other columns. Now let's solve the risk sharing problem and take this consumption to be the target. This is consumption of household J in state epsilon. And we're gonna do that, obviously, over all states epsilon and all households J. Say there are a little n of them. We get an equation of this form. So don't get lost in the notation, I'll help. This is consumption of household J in state one, consumption of household J in state two, likewise in state capital S. That's a target, and just imagine it solved the Pareto problem. How can we achieve it? We have as controls the fraction of type K land held by household J, and now those fractions alpha J vary with K. So we're allowing land type specific allocation of shares. Anyway, if you do the linear algebra here, here's the yield of type one land in state one, the yield of type two land in state one, et cetera, these alphas would then multiply E1, alpha one, E2, alpha two, et cetera. So adding it up like a dot product, you would get consumption. Consumption is coming from a share weighted version of the yields. Hopefully the algebra is clear. Writing it in matrix notation, we just want to get this quote endowment matrix E times the share vector for household J, varying over type K land, it's a vector, equal to the state dependent consumptions. So E times alpha equals CJ. So then the question is, to achieve this target, can we find alphas that do it? And that's like solving this equation. So essentially, you know, take an inverse or something. If there are as many return vectors over types of land that are independent of each other as there are states, then this matrix has an inverse. It's non-singular. So you can solve this equation. So now we'll have, you know, solutions for the alphas. And it turns out if you do that, not just for household J, but over all of them, you'll get an implication that the sum of the alphas will add up to, to one.
so they do look like shares. Type K land held in fraction alpha J by the Jth household when summed over, there should be a sum here, there was one there, when summed over J would equal one. So all the land is divided, all the land of each type K is totally divided among all the households. You could run into a little bit of problem if the alphas went negative, because then, you know, that's like trying to go short. We're not gonna allow that to happen. So there's a little bit of a fly in the ointment, but roughly speaking, there's a way to achieve an optimal allocation of risk sharing just by shares. So they don't need to transfer risk around X post. They can do it all X ante. Now, in order to achieve that, we had to ignore the negative alphas, but more to the point, we had to assume there are as many types of land as there are states of the world. Maybe that's not true. I don't know. You could go both ways. How many different types of land are there, and how many different states can a given land type take on? If there's incredible heterogeneity over land, you know, it's entirely possible that the number of types was equal, if not greater than the number of states. But I could also imagine the other way around, like the Thai village, you've got low land and high land, you put them in two categories, and then you have multiple states, you'd have an incomplete version. Let's see how bad it is though. Maybe as an approximation, they were doing pretty well by dividing up the land, even if they couldn't achieve the optimal allocation perfectly. So, Let's put in two different utility functions. For household one, we have constant relative risk aversion. And for household two, it's a quadratic function. This quadratic thing is a pain and always scary when you see it. It's like there's a bliss point. We've talked about this. Consumption is less than the bliss point assumed so that the margin utility of consumption is always positive. Otherwise, you see a lot of negative signs and it's kind of disturbing. Is this cons 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 consumption be higher than the bliss point? No, you'll, because you'll get margin of utility being negative, moving negatively with consumption. So anyway, just so you feel a bit more comfortable, let's put in alpha equal to 0.5, k equal 0 0.002, and b equal to 80. So we have completely com parameterize this family of utility functions. And again, we have different preferences here, but nice concave utility, strictly, for both. We've got two types of land, and we're back to, say, having three or more states of the world. So ex ante division into shares cannot work perfectly. To see how far we get, we constrain the programming problem to nevertheless search over these shares alpha JK of household J share of type K land, and we maximize a lambda weighted sum of ex ante expected utilities. Oh, well, there's only one date here, so ignore the dynamics, but there are multiple states. And we're gonna max this thing subject to shares can't go negative and they have to add up to one. So it's a constrained programming problem. We could call the solution to this constrained optimal. It's constrained by the premise that the mechanism only allows ex ante division into shares and not ex post consumption transfers. Not gifts, not borrowing and lending, nothing. Now you know from our work on Pareto optimal allocations, there's going to be a Pareto frontier. So it's not like there's one solution. It's going to vary with the lambdas. So we'll do something special as an example which is to maximize the utility of household one subject to the utility of household two at an arbitrary constant. So let me show you a picture and then I'll go back. We're in utility space. So we have the utilities of household one and household two. And we have sort of, if we didn't have a constrained problem, we'd have this outer frontier of the set of all possible utilities on the boundary. And we'll call that the utility at the full risk sharing. There are many solutions. We got these through hyperplanes previously. There's an equivalent way to do it, which is to fix the utility of one household, namely two, and maximize the utility of the other one. So we would end up right here. But in the constrained problem, we're limited to dividing up land by shares that constrained Pareto frontier is interior, 
still a bit concave, and we would move therefore from where that horizontal utility level for household two hits the outer frontier versus the inner frontier. Well, let's focus on the inner frontier, the constrained problem, and then see how close they're gonna to get to the outer frontier. I solved that thing numerically. I was trying to give you all the parameters for utility functions. Some of it's missing here, covariances, coefficient of variation, and you get a solution that household one has about three quarters, 72% of land type one, and about a quarter of land type two. And household two would be the, on the other side of this at roughly one quarters, three quarters. So one thing to note is that that generates a non-linear sharing rule, but non-optimal rule. I think I missed, when I presented this constrained problem, I neglected the little paragraph at the bottom. Uh, no, it's not there. Well, let me remind you. Again, back to the preference lecture where we did risk and I showed you two particular utility functions, constant ep exponential and constant relative risk aversion with linear schedules. But then I showed you a sure another figure, which was non-linear. Monotone increasing for both households, but non-linear. That came from this specification of utilities. Oh, that's what I was looking for, seen in previous lecture seven. So we know the optimal sharing rules are non-linear. Dividing up into shares suggests we're gonna end up with linear rules. So we're not gonna end up with the optimum, but we can still try to figure out how close the inner frontier is to the outer frontier. So let's look at the transfers. Uh, let me state this clearly. We're gonna try to do it ex ante by division of shares get the constrained optimum, and then look at uh, transfers across the two households, who's paying who, depending on the state, and then finally how those transfers would need potentially to be augmented. So here's the aggregate endowment. This is the sum of the yields over the two types of land. That's also aggregate consumption because this is a static problem. Here is consumption of the individual agents, both of them. This is the consumption of person one, constrained, linear dotted line. Here's the consumption of person two. Constrained is this dot dash line for person two. Constrained is the dot 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 line for person one. They're both linear schedules. Now remember, they're not doing this with transfers. I kind of misspoke a minute ago because they're doing it with ex ante division into shares. But nevertheless, it's not the full blown optimum. It's not the outer frontier in which you can not only have division, but also ex post transfers to get to the full optimum. And those schedules are listed here as unconstrained and they are nonlinear as I was trying to say earlier. So if we look at these states, say five states, and look at consumption under ex ante division of land versus consumption under the full optimum for household one, you can see household one, it's monotonic. Household consumption is logically increasing with the aggregate, but it's a bit different, although monotonic from what it would be under the full optimum. And here you can see at the lowest state, household one would be consuming more under the full optimum, but then less under the full optimum relative to the division less, and then back to being more. Okay, so whoa, here it is over here. Why am I struggling so hard? So this is the amount of the transfer from household two to household one that is necessary to add on to the solution from the ex ante division of land shares only. If you wanted to look at it in a picture, the picture is literally the difference between these two lines. So here, the amount that household one ought to be getting under the full optimum would be higher and therefore ought to get a positive transfer. Here it would be lower, hence a negative transfer. And finally, at the end, positive again. So that's consistent with these numbers where these states going from one to five 
is like moving across the different values of the aggregate endowment. So in summary, I guess there's a couple of takeaways from the second half of this lecture. One, we looked at special mechanisms, in this case, ex ante division of land, and whether or not we could get to an optimal allocation of risk bearing that way. And we saw some special cases where we could. Uh, we had to make the shares different across the different households and maybe different across the different land types, especially so if we accommodated more and more diversity and preferences. The second kind of takeaway from the second part is we might not achieve a full optimum so we would have expected some kind of borrowing and lending and gift giving in that medieval village economy, even if we can't find it in, in the historical records. Or we could just say evidently for institutional reasons we don't understand, they just weren't doing it, but we don't lose our tools. Not all is lost. We are still able to solve for a constrained optimal allocation, solving the so-called Pareto problem or programming problem maximizing lambda weighted sums of utilities subject to constraints with the appropriate control variables, in this case, shares. And then the big picture of this lecture is we're looking at the application of the theory of the optimal allocation of risk bearing. We did that in villages in India, looking at consumption and income data. So from a science point of view, we have a model, we have data. The data can vary across the applications. We can still ask, even if we don't have the data on everything, whether we can see how well the theory fits. And we could do that in, in, the, in the medieval villages. We don't even have data on consumption of individual households. And all we see are pictures of land, but we do have the covariance and variance statistics. So we're kind of able to calibrate the model a bit the way we were calibrating the dynamic storage model. But in this case, not to try to explain why they didn't store very often, but rather to explain this very salient pattern of dividing land into different strips. Okay, so that's all I have for today. All right, see you soon. Thank you so much.